First Kings chapter three. If you have your Bible with you, would you open up for our study tonight in the book of First Kings? If you remember last week, Solomon had a dream. And in that dream, we're told that the Lord asked Solomon to declare anything that he desired. You know, ask, it it says in in verse 5, what shall I give to you? And what God was saying is, Solomon, just share with me what you want. And Solomon prayed that God would give him the wisdom to govern over the people that he had been entrusted. And God honored that request. You know, God God said, you know, Solomon, you could have asked for anything. You could have asked for wealth. You could have asked for, you know, power over your enemies. You, you, could have, you could have asked anything you desired and you asked for wisdom to do the task that I had given you. And so God declares to Solomon, not only am I going to give you wisdom, but I'm going to give you wealth and I'm going to give you uh, pow- power. And, you know, God gave him, you know, the things that... Uh, he didn't even ask for you know, long life. He tells us there in verse eleven, uh, he's going to give him riches. He was going to give him, you know, the things that uh, the natural man would have asked for. But because Solomon was was concerned about his role and the position that he had been put in, you know, God was going to honor that. And and it's an incredible picture for us because you know Solomon is asking for something that was. Uh, um, you know, honorable rather than something that was selfish, something that was noble rather than something that was self-centered. And, and God saw the heart of Solomon. And it told us in that passage that Solomon loved the Lord. And so we, we, we kind of have that as, as the foundation. Now, when we get into verse 16, and it's where we left off, we're going to get an example of Solomon's wisdom. And, and wisdom and knowledge are, are really you know, two different things. It, you know, knowledge is that you are able to accumulate facts. You're able to put together, you know, the, the, the understanding of things. But wisdom is the proper use of that knowledge. So, you know, there, there's, a big, there's a big chasm between someone who can know something, someone who's knowledgeable, and someone who's wise. You, and, and we're living in a day where knowledge is, is, you know, at our fingertips. You know, you ask any question, you can just Type it into your Google and, you know, you, you can get all the knowledge, you know, you, you, can, you can hold. You know, it, it, it's, it's limitless. But there's a big difference between knowledge and wisdom. I, I, I heard one quote. It says, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. Right? <laughs> Big difference, right? And and so as we're going through this passage, I, I think I think it's important that, that you you know we, we you kind of understand there's a, a a wisdom that the Bible speaks about. You know, there's a wisdom that's not natural. It's it's not something that you attain just by by uh, attaining information. Uh, there's an interesting passage, and let me ask you to turn there. We'll we'll come back here to chapter three of First Kings, but. Luke chapter 10. Let me just turn there real quick. Luke chapter 10. Interesting, Jesus is declaring in Luke chapter 10. And we'll begin in verse verse 17. Just kind of, we're going to get that whole context. We're going to read a a section here. Look what he says in Luke 10, 17. And the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, Jesus had sent out the 70 to go and preach the kingdom and do miracles. And they came back and they realized that even the demons were subject to the name of Jesus. 
In other words, they had to obey when they spoke in Jesus' name. Now watch this. And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And G Jesus is declaring to him, look, guys, all of this power, you know, all, all of that is important, all that is valid, all of it is real. But here, here's what you need to be excited about. This is what you need rejoicing over is that you're sealed by God's spirit, that your name's already written in heaven. And then Jesus says in verse 21, and, and, and watch how all this plays together. Watch what he says. And in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth that you've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and you revealed them to babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. He says, God, you've hidden these things from the wise. Now, there's a, not, not only is there a difference between knowledge and wisdom, but there's a, there's a difference between earthly wisdom and spiritual wisdom. And what Jesus is declaring is, look, guys, the wise of this world can't even comprehend the wisdom of God. There, there, there's something that totally is, is you know, different from the two. And what, what, what we're going to see in, in Solomon's life is that, is that Solomon had a wisdom, not just a worldly wisdom, but he had a divine wisdom. He had a godly wisdom. He was able to discern things because of, because of his prayer, because God had given him that kind of a wisdom that wasn't just a natural wisdom. It was going to be a supernatural wisdom. Another passage in, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, it says this, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. No, notice notice what, what Paul says to the Corinthians. Look, we, we don't, we don't, we have a different spirit and only by the spirit of God can you understand godly things. It's not a natural thing. It's not something you can attain by, by, you know, reading a book or even reading the Bible. It's got to be a spiritual encounter with God that you understand God's heart and God's plans and God's wisdom. Matter of fact, he would, he would tell us in, in the book of, First Corinthians, and man, I, I uh, let me let me turn there. First Corinthians, chapter three. In verse eighteen, he says, "Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool, that he might become wise." For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Therefore, let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollo, Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things pertaining, uh, or things to come, things present, things to come, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. And no, notice what, what Paul does. He says, look, you want to know wisdom, you, you, you have to know Jesus. You have to know Christ. Th that's where wisdom is founded. It's, it's not founded in anything this world can, can supply us or give us. And so it's, it's here that, that we're, we're going to look at Solomon now applying the wisdom that God had given him. And we don't know when this happened in his reign. We're going to look at from chapter 3 to chapter 4. And we're going to kind of get a, a kind of an overview of Solomon's life. And it seems as though, you know, this was just an event that, that is being recorded. Kind of giving us an example of the wisdom that God had given Solomon. Uh, and he places it right here uh, after he'd asked for God to give him wisdom. Notice what happens in verse 16. He says, now, two women who were harlots came to the king and they stood before him. 
One woman said, oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house and I gave birth while she was in the house. And it happened in the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth and we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She arose in the middle of the night, took my son from my side while your maidservant slept and laid in her, laid in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I arose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was dead. But when I came, when I had examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. And the woman said, no, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, no, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Now, I mean, can you imagine, you, you, you got these two women, and the, the scripture tells us they were harlots. And they had access to Solomon. You know, at any time there was a hard case, you know, Solomon was there to, to you know, make a decision when it came to, uh, you know, the, the case that w was at hand. And so Solomon is there before these two harlots. And they're both claiming that the, the living son was their son. Now, you know, if you've ever been in that predicament, you know, you're just kind of like, I, I don't know which one is telling the truth. You ever get your kids come up and they just like, you know, he did it. No, he did it. No, he, you know, just like, I'll spank both of you then. You know, that's just, we'll take care of this. You know, you just, you do, I don't know which is telling the truth. I don't know who's lying. We'll, we'll just, we'll just kind of, you know, give you both the same punishment and then, you know, I'll, I'll be half right. Right. <laughs> you kind of know that you're, you're kind of got one out of two and you, you just, you just real, realize that's the way it's going to go. But Solomon here, you know, was put in a predicament. It, was, it wasn't, you know, giving someone a, a you know, a, a whooping or it wasn't, you know, it, Solomon has to decide who's going to get the, the live child. Who's the real mom? Who's the real, who's the real parent here? And so Solomon says in verse 23, the one says, this is my son who lives and your son is the dead one. And the other says, no, but your son is the dead one. And my son is the living one. The king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, divide the living child in two and give half to one and give half to the other. And the woman whose son was living spoke to the king for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, oh, my Lord, give her the living child and by no means kill him. And the other said, let him neither be mine nor yours, but divide him. Wow. But they think, think, think about what, what, what happened as soon as mom saw I mean, I, I would imagine even as soon as the words came out of the king's mouth, give me a sword, she was already going, oh my goodness. And she was moved with compassion for her son. She, you know, if I never saw my son again, at least he would be alive. At least he'd be out there. At least he would, he would have a chance. And the other one was so bitter. She was so, you know, so uh, angry. If I can't have my son, then you shouldn't have yours other. I mean, she, you know, and Solomon had the wisdom to discern between the two women. And it tells us in, in, in the passage, watch this. So the king answered and said, give the first woman the living child and by no means kill him. She is his mother. And all of Israel heard of the judgment which the king had rendered and they feared the king. For they saw that the, check this out, the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. You see, guys, there, there was, there, they acknowledge, you know what, that wasn't a natural wisdom. That was a divine wisdom. It was a godly wisdom. And I, I think it's an important passage because I, I think, you know, what's happening is that everyone in Israel begins to understand, you know what, Solomon 
you know, you're not going to get away with your, your, your conniving. You're not going to pull one over on Solomon. He's too wise for that. And so everyone begins to fear and begins to get in line because they know that truth was going to reign in Jerusalem and in Israel under Solomon's reign. And so he begins to, you know, establish himself as someone who's wise. And when God calls somebody and that person submits himself under God's rule, under God's authority and says, God, I, I don't have the wisdom to do what you've called me to do, but I desire to do what you want me to do. You know, God begins to infill that person with a supernatural wisdom to do what God called them to do. And that's where Solomon's at. I, I think, you know, earlier in Exodus chapter 36, there's another interesting character by the name of Bezalel. Moses was commanded to, to build an ark and the tabernacle and, you know, he was commanded to, to you know, build the, all, all of the, the instruments to worship God. And it tells us in Exodus 36, Bezalel and Ahola, Aholib and every gifted artisan in whom the Lord has put wisdom and understanding to know how to do all the manner of work for the service of the sanctuary shall do according to all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Aholib and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, every one whose heart was stirred to come and to do the work. And they received from Moses the offerings which the children of Israel had brought to the work of the service and making the sanctuary. So they continued bringing them free will offerings in every morning. And the craftsmen were doing all the work of the sanctuary, each from the work he was doing. And I, I love it because what, what happens? You know, God gave him a task, but God didn't say, okay, go and do the task. Good luck. God says, now I'm going to give you the skill, the ability, the wisdom to accomplish the task that I've given you. And that's what makes, you know, ministry and serving the Lord and taking your life and surrendering it. You know, that, that, that's where you get the ability and the power to do it by the wisdom of God, not by natural power, not by natural wisdom, but by supernatural wisdom. And it, it's, it's amazing because as, as you look at this, this whole picture, you know, Solomon here is just implementing the gifts that he had been given. And all of, all of Israel was amazed by it. They're all going, man, you know, we're, you know, this guy is dealing with, you know, we're dealing with something way beyond the natural. We're, we're, deal, we're dealing with something in the supernatural realm. And so fear came upon them. And not only fear it says that they understood that Solomon would administer justice from that time forward. I, I think that's a, that's, that's a, you know, we need to be praying for our leaders, don't we? That they have a supernatural wisdom, that they surrender their lives, their minds, their hearts. I mean, the thing about where we're at as a nation, because we've rejected God and, and because of it, we find yourself in a, in a, in a, just a, a cesspool. It's, it's a mess. Could you imagine if our leaders would just bow their knee and say, God, I don't know how to do this. Would you give me wisdom to be able to do what I'm doing? And Solomon was that man, you know, he, he, he understood I'm way over my head. Remember, he, he's somewhere around, you know, 19, 20 years old. By the time he starts to build the temple, when we get to chapter 6, he, he's, he, we know it was four years after his reign. And Solomon was somewhere around 16 years old when he came into power. He knew that, you know, his wisdom wasn't going to cut it. He knew that it was way outside of his ability. But he also knew that God had put him there. And therefore, that's why he's asking God, I, I need your wisdom to do what you've asked me to do. And I think that for all of us, God, I think that there, there's something for us to, to you know, consider there, to take away from there. This, you know, wherever God's placed you, man, if you're asking him for wisdom, he'll provide you with it. Matter of fact, James chapter 1 and, and, and in verse, and verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith 
with no doubting, for he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. He says, look, if you're lacking wisdom, what, 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 what do we do? We ask God. And you ask in faith. You ask with, you know, God, I, I, don't, have, I don't have it. I know that I, 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 there's nothing I'm going to do to obtain it, so I need you to provide me for it. And when you ask in faith, he says, God will give liberally wisdom to those who ask. Just like Solomon did. And, and it, it is available to you and to me, you know, for, for the, the task that God has for us to do. Asking God for wisdom and for direction and for guidance. Now, now it, it's interesting that as, you, as we come to the end of chapter 3, chapter 4, we're going to get all of Solomon's administration. We're, you know, all, all of the guys that were put into position under Solomon's reign. And there in verse 1, he says, So King Solomon was king over all of Israel. These were his officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. Elhilarif and Ahijah, the son of Shisha, scribes. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ehud, the recorder. And Ananiah, the son of Jehuda, over the army. Zadok and Abathar, the priest. Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers. Zibud, the son of Nathan, a priest, and the king's friend. Right? I mean, he make, makes note of that. Ahasar, over the household. And Adoniram, the son of Abda, over the labor force. And Solomon had 12 governors over all of Israel who provided food for the king and his household. Each one made provisions for one month of the year. Now, you know, think about it. You got, he's got 12 different leaders. Now, he kind of got all of these guys, the priests, the scribes, the recorders, the priests, the army, uh, you know, captains, the officers, those who were over his household, those who were over his labor force. I mean, Solomon, you know, had a, quite an organized cabinet. And all of these men were given responsibilities. You know, Solomon is dividing it all up. You know, he kind of learned the lessons. That, you know, he wasn't going to be able to handle this, this task that was given to him. So he needed to appoint different men with different abilities and different gifts in order to be able to handle the different, you know, areas of his, of his leadership and of the kingdom. And then it tells us that there were 12 governors and they were, you know, they kind of divided it up. You know, one month you take care of the king's, you know, food needs and, the, and his household needs. And they had 12 different, you know, regions that would take care of the household needs. Now, verses 8 all the way to verse 19 gives us the names of those guys. And if you're interested in knowing who was doing that, you can read that later. It's a long list. <laughs> 12 different, you know, governors that he had set up. But as we come to verse 20, we kind of we get a, a kind of a, a snapshot of what it was like in the kingdom under Solomon. Watch this, man, incredible. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. There was a prophecy that God had given to Moses. He says, your descendants will be as the sea, the sand by the sea in number. And here under Solomon's reign, the scripture saying, God fulfilled that. It was, it was just, there, there was just, a, you know, an enormous amount of people in the land that they had been given. God was blessing it. God was, you know, all, you know, had his hand all over and they were eating and drinking and rejoicing. In other words, there was a time of great prosperity in the days of Solomon. Unlike the days of David where there was war, where there was, you know, constant battle taking place. You know, David was, was a man who was fighting his whole life. And Solomon comes in because David had such success in his kingdom, he's, he's able to give it to his son, and now they were now eating and drinking and rejoicing. 
Now, verse 21 says, So Solomon reigned over all the kingdom from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute. They served Solomon all the days of his life. And his, the, Israel at that time had expanded its borders immensely. They were from the rivers. They, you know, I mean, the, the Iraq and Iran and you know, a lot of this region in there you know, that, that now had been now part of Israel's kingdom because Solomon had such great power and such great influence. And it's amazing because as you, you know, look at this whole thing is that God was giving Solomon favor. He didn't have to fight one battle. God is going before Solomon. Watch this. Look at verse 22. Now Solomon's provisions, check this out, for one day was 30 cores of, of, of fine flour, 60 cores of meal. Now, you know, this is what his household required to eat on a, in a day. And, and you might be reading that going, what, what a core? What, what's the big deal? A core, that's what a core is. A core is six and a half bushels. One bushel is 60 pounds. So that, you know, you're, you're close to 400 pounds of flour to feed his family. Now, remember, he had 700 wives. <laughs> 300 concubines. Only, only one son that is named of Solomon, but, you know, I, I think it was just the one son because he was the one who was going to take over the kingdom after Solomon dies. But you imagine that Solomon had quite quite a group. I, 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 I was trying to think of a word. A herd of kids. You know. <laughs> <laughs> If you have a thousand women, right? I mean, you, you, you would think that there would be a minimum of a thousand kids. But remember also that Solomon was taking all these foreign wives and ma- many of them weren't, weren't what considered to be Israelites, wouldn't be considered to be Jewish. And, and so maybe that could be the reason for only one of them's named in the scriptures. Interesting. But it's, all, it, but it's amazing, it tells us there was over 400 pounds of flour and 60 cores of meal, which was over 400 pounds of meal. And then watch this. 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, fatted fowl. He had dominion over all the region and the sides of the river from Tifsa, even to Gaza, namely over all the kings and this, this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. I mean, you know, can you imagine just one day? Can you, that, that poor cook. I mean, you, you had a whole army just to feed your family. Can, I mean, th- th- think about this. 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pasture, 100 sheep besides the deer, the gazelles, the roebucks, and the fatted fowl. I mean, that was one day's food. I, 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 don't, I don't know who he was feeding, but that, that was, that's, that's quite, a, that, that's quite a, an army. <laughs> it's, it's almost an undertaking for you know, a, 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 whole, a whole platoon. You know, it, it, it's incredible. But it tells us that this, this was what was happening in the days of Solomon. There was a time of great prosperity. A great wealth. They, they had an abundance. And, and, and not only in, you know, food, but they had an abundance in territory. They had an abundance of wealth. It, gold and silver. They said silver was as common as, as rocks in Jerusalem under the reign of Solomon. And so we just kind of get a little glimpse of what is happening in the day of Solomon. Now, here's interesting. Look, look at verse 25. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, 
from Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now, not only did he have a great abundance of food, not only was there peace all around, but he had a great abundance of power. And it seems as though we're starting to see Solomon's weakness, Solomon's fall. When you begin to accumulate 40,000 stalls just for your horses, I mean, you know, that means he's now gearing up his military. His horsemen that were over his chariots, you know, 12,000 horsemen. That, 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 that's a pretty big accumulation of power. And God had warned the nation of Israel against accumulating horses. And he had warned Israel against accumulating wealth and accumulating wives. Because what he was declaring by doing so is that I'm going to do this by my own power and by own, my own might and by my own strength and by my own wisdom. And Solomon is beginning to fall into a trap. In the book of Deuteronomy, and I'm going to ask you to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And, and I think it's an important passage because remember, it was Saul the king, it was David the king, and now Solomon the king. He's the third king of Israel. And there were some very clear instructions given to the king. Solomon and most scholars that, 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 I've, that I've read believe that Nathan the prophet would have been the influence in Solomon's life. Therefore, Solomon would have known these things written in the book of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 17, in the verse 15, it says, You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren, you shall set a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of the kingdom he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of the law and the statutes, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Look at the warning God had given. The warning that, that you know, once you begin to put your attention on the things of this world, then, you know, you're, you're gonna, your heart's going to wander. Once you begin to accumulate for yourself horses and wives and wealth, then you're, you're, you're going to begin to you know, be distracted by this stuff rather than keeping your eyes on God. And he says, you're to take the word of God and you're to make yourself a copy of it. Can you imagine every king was required to take God's word and then to print it out himself? There's something that happens when not, you know, you're just not hearing it, but now you're writing it. And as you're writing it down, as you're, you know, word for word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you're documenting what God said and you're, you know, not only hearing it and, and as you're reading it, but you're also, you know, writing it. 
And what's happening is that you're becoming familiar with what God declares. And Solomon would have had to have written Deuteronomy chapter 17. And even though he had heard this stuff, he wasn't going to apply it to himself. Remember, remember what wisdom is. Wisdom is the application of the knowledge. It's taking what you hear and then now applying it to your life. And even though Solomon is using his wisdom in so many arenas, he's lacking that wisdom when it comes to, you know, some of his personal decision making. And it's incredible because I, I think it's here that you, we kind of start to see those, those, those first signs of Solomon, you know, starting to veer away from truth. You got you kind of got, got, got that 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 kind of that sense that you know something's happening in Solomon's life because he's now accumulating things that God had told him not to accumulate. Started off with horses. And then he went to wealth. And then he went to women. And he, every one of the warnings that were given to him, he ignored. Now, look, look at verse 27. And these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table. Check this out. There was no lack in their supply. And, and, and what the Holy Spirit is declaring is that these guys had an overabundance of everything. That there, 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 was, there, was, there was want for nothing. There, there, there wasn't anything that they held back that, that you know, he, he didn't have access to, that he does, anything he desired, he was able to get. And every provision and every supply was at Solomon's disposal. And guys, I think there's a danger there. In the, in the book of... Ezekiel chapter 16. We're told why Sodom and Gomorrah was judged. Now, I know we, we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and actually in Ezekiel 16, he's talking about very specifically about Sodom. But we, 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 we have, you know, this immediate kind of thought that Sodom and Gomorrah was judged because of their sexual immorality that was taking place in the land. They, they, had, they, they, they had given themselves over to every sexual perversion. And I think, oh yeah, that, that's why they were judged. Ezekiel tells us different. Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 48 says this, As I live, says the Lord God, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughter have done as you and your daughter have done. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. And the problem with Sodom was pride and fullness of food and idleness. And what God was telling in Ezekiel is that that's the very same thing that the children of Israel had fallen into. They, 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 their, their pride, their abundance of food, and the idle time that they had, it just was a perfect ground for all of the evil that they ended up doing. And what's happening in Solomon's life is identical. Because Solomon had such a, a, an abundance that, you know, he, he, just, he, he was just going to 
not even know what to do with his, you know, all of the time he had. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't depending on the Lord any longer. He was, he was just, you know, thinking that, that he, he was just going to live his life for Solomon rather than from the Lord because he had everything he needed. I think there's something to being dependent upon the Lord. There, there's something to us, you know, I think what, what one of the, the, the Proverbs, it says, Lord, don't give me more than I need because then I'll forget you. Don't give me less than I need lest I go and, and steal and, and, and profane your name. Right? I think there's something about God, God you know, supply my needs. Let, let, let me have a heart that, that, that's not idle, that, that's not overwhelmed with, with abundance so that I, I, get, I get distracted from the, the, the things I'm supposed to be doing. And Solomon here, it says, there was no lack of any supply in Solomon's life or in the, in the life of Israel at that time. And no, no, notice, look at verse 28. And they brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and the steeds, each man according to his charge. In other words, you know, the animals had an abundance. You know, it wasn't just the people had an abundance. You know, they, they were bringing barley and straw for the animals. It was, you know, there, there was just an, an, an overabundance of, of everything. And notice verse 29, and God gave Solomon wisdom and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sands of the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan and Ezrahite and Heman and Cholco and Darda and the sons of Mahol and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. In other words, now Solomon's wisdom, you know, had exceeded everyone's wisdom and people were coming from afar to learn from Solomon. Because God had blessed him. And now Solomon, you know, is, is, he's, he's beginning to play a little bit loose with what God had declared to him. I, 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 can, I, I can handle it. I, I can, you know, accumulate wives. It's not going to affect me. I can accumulate gold. It's not going to affect me. I can accumulate horses. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm the exception to the rule. And somewhere along the right, and I think the only way you get there is by pride. Once you think that you're above the word of God, man, it's pride. Because you think that what God said doesn't apply to you. It applies to everybody else, but it doesn't apply to you. Guys, Solomon, we're, we're going to see a few good years, but, but it, we're, we're going to see a really bad season in Solomon's life. It appears that at the end of his life, he came to a census, right? In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, he, he says, you know, at the end of it, he goes, after I did everything in my life, he goes, here's, here's the whole of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. There's man's all. But there's going to be a season where he goes and he runs after everything, pursues every, every kind of, of vice. He, he withholds nothing from himself. And, and it, it's an incredible picture because what, what you find here is that Solomon is exceeding in wisdom than, than any other man that ever lived. Uh, and, and up to this point, it, it says no one before you and no one after you is going to possess the wisdom. Watch, watch what he kind of gives us a picture of that. Look, look at verse 32. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. 3,000 proverbs. A thousand songs to his name, you know, with, with Solomon's signature underneath it. <laughs> you can't play that, it's copyrighted. <laughs> Solomon's. And he had, he had a, a, a thousand of the songs that, that were accredited to him, a thousand and five. Look with this. He spoke of trees, from the cedar trees to Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. 
In other words, you know, every arena of life, you know, Solomon was the master. He, he was, he was, he was the, the, the guy who could explain, you know, about all, how, how to breed and how, how, to, how to care for and how to, how, how, to, how to make every, you know, just all the different arenas. I don't even know the names for all the ologies that are there, but it's incredible because you, you realize that Solomon possessed a wisdom, not, not, not just a knowledge, but a wisdom of all of these different areas of life because God had provided it to him. And, and, and if, if, if God provides this kind of a wisdom to a man, you know, what do you do with that wisdom? What, what do you do if God's blessed you with an extra amount of tenacity or an extra amount of, of, of knowledge or an extra amount of wisdom? Or, you know, what, what, what do you do with those things if you, if you, if you have, you know, greater abilities than, than most? I mean, what, what do you do with that stuff? We, we see what, 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 our, what our world does with it. So, someone has a talent when, when it comes to music. They, they go and they, you know, live it up and, and, you know, boast about how great they are. And then, you know, the wealth that they possess, the fame they possess, and they use it all for their own glory. Or an athlete that, you know, he's on the field and, you know, he talks about how, how awesome he is and how great he is. And, and rather than using what God had given you for the, the furtherance of God and his purposes. And, and Solomon here, it says every arena. Look, look at verse 34 and then we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Watch what he says. And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. See, the, the, yet it spread. It spread. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Let me ask you to turn there real quick. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Right, right past Psalms and Proverbs, you come to the book of Ecclesiastes. In the second chapter, in the 10th verse, watch what Solomon says. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure for my heart rejoiced in all my labor and this was my reward from all my labor and I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had toiled and indeed all was vanity and grasping for the wind for there was no prophet under the sun. Wow. And all of the wisdom, Solomon comes to the conclusion, look, everything I did, I withheld nothing from myself. Every pleasure, every desire, every want, you know, anything that my heart, you know, sought after, I, I, I didn't withhold any of it from myself. And then he comes to this place where he says, you know what? And I came to the realization that all of it was for nothing. That, that it, it was all vanity. And here's a man who, who, who had the, the, the wisdom above any other man that lived on the face of the earth. And he, at the end of his life, he just said, look, all, everything I did, everything I pursued, all of the, the, the wealth, all of the, the pleasure, all of the, the purposes that I had sought to, to please myself in, it, it all came to nothing. And guys, I'll I tell you, there, there, there's something for you and I here. Because the only thing that, that's going to that's gonna bring gratification to your life and to my life is if we're, is for bringing what God has given us and we, and we submit it to him and we say, God, what, is, what am I here for? And how do I use what you've given me so that you get all the glory in it? Because that's the only thing that's gonna count when it's all said and done. Your life is like a vapor, my life like a vapor. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. Solomon's gonna build the temple. Think, think about this, guys. He, he's, the, he's the guy who, who built one of the marvels of the world. And it was, a, it was for a very good purpose, a very good reason. He, he, he builds the temple that everyone would come to worship at. The first temple. 
And even after all of that adventure, you know, all, all, all of the success, all of the, 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 the wealth that it took to, to, you know, put into that, he comes to the end of it all and he said it was all vanity because Solomon had lost his purpose along the way. He lost his way. And the only way you and I are going to get out of this life with, with, with satisfaction and gratification and, and, and you know, knowing that, that we're, we were, were fulfilling the thing that God had created us to fulfill is if we bring ourselves under his rulership and under his lordship and under his, you know, his direction and asking for his wisdom. I, I know this. I, I, I don't want to leave this life, this life w- without fulfilling the purpose that God put me here for. I, I, I don't want to get to the end of it and say, man, I missed the, my, 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 the reason. I missed the, 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 I missed the boat. And I believe God has a purpose. He has a purpose for my life. He's got a purpose for your life. And we can take everything that God's given us and we can squander it. And we can get to the end and say it was all vanity. Or we can get to the end and we can say, man, I, I saw God work. And I had an opportunity to be part of what God was doing. And everything I've stored, it's, it, 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 it's secure because it's stored in heaven, man. Because everything here, it's all going to go to waste. And, and it's just an interesting passage because you, you, you look at Solomon and, you know, I, I, you look at all of his accomplishments. You look at all of the things that, that he possessed. You look at all of his wealth and all of his, his, his power. And, and he, he himself declares it was all for nothing. And I can't help but to look at the end of it, you know, as, as we're reading the, the beginning of it. Because you look back and you're, it's in very impressive. <laughs> very impressive. You, you sit there and read that and go, man, I, I, I want to meet this guy. I want to, I you know, I want to spend some time with this guy. I mean, matter of fact, every, every ruler in, in, in the world desired to do that. They came from all nations to come in here to learn from Solomon. But he would come to the end and say, it was, I, I wasted it. I wasted it. And there's a wisdom that, that, that somehow Solomon neglected. And it was the wisdom that God provided to know him to follow him, to seek after him. And it's a prayer that, that you know, I, I, that James 1.5, it says, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. He gives liberally. But it's, it's not just so that you possess the wisdom. It's so that you would fulfill the purpose that God had given you. 